last half century, the Black Panther Party has been depicted as a fringe separatist, even terrorists. Their ideas and community activism have been glossed over. Yeah, countering police brutality was also at the core of the Black Panther's mission. And our continuing series, Create Equal, picks up Zana Harry, shows us the impact the Black Panther movement has on today's fight for social justice. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover once called them the greatest internal threat to national security. Neutralize him by any means necessary. Fifty years later, the Black Panther Party is back in the spotlight with the new film, Judas and the Black Messiah. Daniel Kaluuya portrays Chicago Panther leader Fred Hampton. Reading the script and hearing his words stirred me. They moved me. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it, 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 it was almost like a call to action. Hampton was betrayed by a fellow Black Panther member who was also an FBI informant and later shot to death during a Chicago police raid. And you can murder a freedom fighter, but you can't murder freedom. It was 1966 in Oakland, California. Young activists started a new political organization, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, after being disillusioned by the civil rights movement. When Dr. King got assassinated, those of us that were talking about um, nonviolence uh, got really angry. The following year, Black Panthers grabbed the nation's attention after walking into the California state legislature fully armed. And I thought, they're crazy. They've got guns, they got leather coats. Inspired by their boldness and hungry for social change, Jamal Joseph, at just 15 years old, stepped into the Black Panther office in Harlem. I jump up and I said, arm me, brother. And he calls me up to the front. Everybody gets quiet. And he reaches uh, down. He's sitting at a desk and he hands me. I thought it was going to be a big gun. It was a stack of books. Misconceptions about the Black Panthers have persisted since the 1960s. Their work in the community on a grassroots level is often overlooked. In fact, they created a 10-point program for community empowerment. Good afternoon and welcome back to My Harlem Portrait, the show that wants to shed a light on the fundamental contribution of African Americans to the building of the, this country. We are here today to talk to an exceptional gentleman who has managed to squeeze at least two lives into his existence till now, and both with excellent results. I'm talking about Jamal Joseph. Welcome to my Harlem portrait, Jamal. Thank you, Maria. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm honored that you had the time to do this because you are a civil rights activist. You're a member of the Black Panther Party since the 60s. You are today a recognized Columbia professor and an award-winner theater producer, writer, and filmmaker. So last night I watched this just released movie, Judas and the Black Messiah which is about the Black Panther. It has brought once again, so the spotlight on the party that 50 years ago was considered by the FBI director, the greatest internal threat to national security. Tell me, let's talk about this film just a little bit and let me know what you think about it and tell our viewers what is the story about, please. Well, Judas and the Black Messiah is about Fred Hampton, who was the leader of the Illinois state chapter of the Black Panther Party. The headquarters were in Chicago. Fred was a truly dynamic leader. Fred had been involved in the civil rights movement since he was 13 years old. Wow. And was an honor student, was a football player, but always put social justice first. And he was a recognized leader in the NAACP when he joined the Black Panther Party. He joined the Black Panther Party when he was 19 years old and quickly became, became an inspirational leader because of his ability to speak and to inspire people. But the other thing really important to note about Fred Hampton was that he was a tremendous organizer. 
he was able to take those experiences that he got in the NAACP and in the black church and organize community programs that brought people in contact with the Black Panther Party. Things like the breakfast program, things like a free health clinic, which was, if you look at the health clinic that Fred Hampton and his uh, uh, Doc Satchel was a young man who helped organize that. He was given the nickname Doc because he knew so much about medicine and cared so much. Doc was only 19 years old. Oh, it's, it, it's, it's a model for community clinics the way we see it today. It was a place where people could get treated, diagnosed. They had counseling. They were doing mental health. You have to know this is at a time that mental health uh, uh, counseling was almost taboo in the black community to talk about it as a thing. They would say, you know, go pray about it or, you know, stay in the bedroom until you feel better. It wasn't an issue that we, we just recently started recognizing that. So Fred was really ahead of his time. And the other thing that was really uh, amazing about what he did was organizing gang members, but also poor working class white people uh, the Latino community, the Young Lords was the biggest Latino gang in Chicago. And Fred became friends with a man named Chacha uh, Jimenez. Mm -hmm. And you see him in the funeral yeah. scene. And together they began doing labor organizing and Chacha converted the street gang into what we now famously know as the Young Lords Party, a socialist organization that fought, that also had breakfast programs that called for the independence of Puerto Rico. So the level of political education that happened, making people aware of the problem beyond racial lines, creating the rainbow coalition. This is a term that they came up with. People That's think incredible. Jesse Jackson, people think Jesse Jackson Created. came up with this term. Jesse Jackson saw what the Panthers and the Lords and uh, white groups like Rising Up Angry, uh, the Patriot Party, he saw what they did and he saw the effect that, that they had and then created what he called rainbow push. And I think that that's what people fear the most about Fred Hampton in terms of the authorities, in terms of the FBI and their counterintelligence program. And also there's a character who was a, uh, 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 who was a very uh, hate-filled person focused on destroying Fred Hampton and the Black Panther Party, it was the district attorney, Hanrahan, yeah. who waged this campaign and was the one that had Fred arrested and framed, claiming that he robbed an ice cream truck for $70 worth of ice cream, you know, that he actually robbed the truck and gave the ice cream away. Um, and what made Fred a threat was his organizing ability. Yeah. He was bringing the city together. You know, the Panthers uh, had a greeting and the greeting was all power to the people. And whenever Fred would start a speech or any of us would start a speech, we'd say all power to the people and people would say power to the people. And then we would explain it. Back in the day, we called it break it down. Mm -hmm. We would say that means black power for black people. People would say right on. We said, but that means white power for white people. It means brown power for brown people, red power for red people yellow power for yellow people and X power to, to everyone else that we may not have included. And then you may say white power to white people, they have power. There is a capitalist ruling class that has power. Mm -hmm. But what Fred Hampton recognized and the Black Panther Party recognized is that there's more white people living in poverty, yep. a victim of an oppressive system than black people. And the same is true from, you know, from our, uh, you know, certainly from my First Nation Native brothers and sisters mm -hmm. and for our Asian brothers and sisters. So when we organize around the common poverty, oppression, slum lords, lack of health care, all of the things that are still true today, yeah. uh, that was true 50 years ago, then the city of Chicago starts saying, Fred is leading a movement that will take over the city. If you get the gang members to put their guns down or not use the guns on each other and to face down the police and face down police brutality, the sheer mathematics of that number frightened them. Because I think at that time there were about 15 or 20,000 Chicago police officers 
there might have been 50, 60, 70,000 gang members. Oh, wow. And so Fred succeeded. You know, in the movie, they're called the Crowns, but in real life, they, 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 it was a gang called, uh, an organization called the Blackstone Rangers. And then there was the Black Disciples. And Fred was, was politicizing these people. And they were starting community programs. Not all of them became Panthers, as they depicted in the movie, but they became politically aware. Exactly. And this is the goal of reorganization. So for all of those reasons, uh, they felt like Fred was the Black Messiah. You know, Jay Hoover actually says this words, we have to put down the rising of a, of a Black Messiah. And, you know, Bobby Seale, who was co-founder of the Black Panther Party, was uh, was arrested and and, uh, and framed for a murder charge. Huey Newton was shot in, in a confrontation with the police and he was facing the gas chamber. So as they were looking at other Panther leaders who might have that same national and international, for Eldridge Cleaver uh, was in political exile, mm -hmm. Fred Hampton was the person. Yeah. He was that charismatic leader that could do it. And so... Uh, and, and so that's who Fred Hampton was. Now, the movie focuses a lot on this person named O'Neill, who um, was an FBI informer and who was very close. And he was a security captain and his betrayal of Fred Hampton. The things I really enjoyed about the movie was that they, they showed the emphasis on political education yeah. and the community. Um, I think people. And yeah, they did it. I I. I know that from the Hollywood standpoint and the director Shaka King who uh, who I think did a strong job with the film and making it feel like the 60s and feel like Chicago at that time I mean has often said the only way he could get the film made was to make it like a Donnie Brasco kind of story yeah where you see everything through the eyes of the informant um, I wish we had a little bit more time with Fred uh, and the Panthers and the community, his family, a lot of things that I learned about Fred as I, you know, uh, you know, he was a hero to us when he was alive, certainly after he was killed. Uh, you know, some of the, that, that, that there was more time spent on that and a little bit less about the informer and his relationship with the FBI. But I've spoken a lot and I do think it's a good window into history. And I do think it, that it, it will inspire people to do more research to find out more about Fred Hampton uh, and the Black Panther Party. And for that, I appreciate that they were able to get the film made and released. Yeah, that was uh, very appreciated and, and very interesting. And you know, no, you, you don't know, but one of the reasons why I live in Harlem today is because of the Black Panthers and because of uh, Malcolm X. Because when I heard, I was a little girl and I heard that they killed Malcolm X, that X somehow resounded with me because I didn't understand what it was, Malcolm X. So later on in life, I started, when I was a teenager, I started studying about Malcolm X and Angela Davis and the Black Panthers and all that. And that is what sparked in me the, the willingness to come to Harlem and see Harlem and see all the places that they were talking about. And I remember that they talked about the Black Panthers and the breakfast uh, program that they had for children. And all this for me was, I need to go and see this place because I've always been very left wing. So, you know, for me, this was okay. This, I like that in America. So, and, you, and you and I are neighbors and we actually live near Malcolm X Boulevard. Yeah. Right. You're around the corner. I'm right on Malcolm X. And that corner is the mosque that Malcolm X founded in Harlem. Yeah. It, it was renovated. The building wasn't the original building, but but this area was uh, was 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 Malcolm's stomping ground. You mm -hmm. know, you could you could be on the street and see Malcolm almost every day. I know I am like. I wish I'd been there at that time <laughs> because it's amazing. What, can I point out one thing though? That, <laughs> that, that I think is important when you mentioned the breakfast program, there are two big misconceptions about the Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, one is that the Panthers hated white people. That, that I we was were black power. I like that, perfect, yes. go ahead. <laughs> right, and so, and, you know, my first day in the Panther office, when I went in, 
I thought that in order to prove myself, I had to say that I hated white people. In fact, if you want to give me a gun, I'll kill a white guy right now. I mean, <laughs> I was an honor student and going to church, right? but that's what my friends told me I had to say. And uh, instead of instead of giving me a gun, they handed me books. Mm -hmm. And I said, I thought you were going to arm me. And the the uh, the Panther officer that was running the meeting said, I just did. And then he said, look, you came in here really mad at white people. Let me ask you a question. He said, if all of the cops in the community who were brutal, who are savage, who beat people up, who lock people up, who shoot them down, if they were all black and the people being brutalized and murdered were white, if all of the slumlords with these buildings that have rats running down the hallway and no heat and ceilings falling in, if they were black, if all of the store owners that are ripping people off with spoiled products and high prices, if they were black, in fact, the Congress, the Senate, the president, if they were all black and all of the poor press people were white, would that make things correct? And I thought for a second, I said, well, no, sir, it seems like it would still be wrong. And he said, that's right. He said, this is a class struggle for yeah. human rights, not a race struggle. The other misconception is about the violence. You see it in the film where Panthers are armed. And so that's the impression that we walked around with leather coats with guns all day, you know, openly in states where you could carry open, but concealed. Mm -hmm. Your day in the Panther party was starting with the breakfast program. And then if you were in school or college organizing, then you would report to another program. It might be the health clinic. It might be a building that was having a rent strike. If you did community patrol, it was with a camera to take pictures of what was happening and to intervene and to, to do that. So you, you held a pancake spatula and young children, you know, much more than you held a gun. You might hold a gun if it was your turn to be on security because by that time, we knew that there was a chance that any night could be the night the police would try to kick in your door and murder you in your bed the way they did Fred Hampton. So for that, for guard duty, but your work in the community was around those community programs and then using those programs to educate people, to point out the contradictions. Why do we have to have self-started community programs to feed our children when we live in the richest nation on earth? How can this government afford to put a man on the moon, but they can't put a, a, a hot breakfast uh, a plate of hot food in front of a, a hungry child. That was your work in the Black Panther Party. You were missionaries, really. That's what you were, educators and missionaries. And when he gave you the books and he said, I just did arm you, he armed you with knowledge. We go in and get knowledge because knowledge is a weapon, is the most incredible weapon one can have. And that's why white supremacists and the slave owners didn't want black people to learn, to write and read and so on. So I understand that. And in fact, the Black Panther Party was, the title was the Black Panther Party for self-defense. It wasn't for attack. <laughs> yeah, it was for self-defense. And the Panthers had, and, and, and I hope everybody that sees any of the Panther documentaries and the film Judas for Black Messiah, or the sees this interview would read the Panther 10 point program, which you can Google very easily, uh, which was written in 1966. Those points still hold up today. And it shows what the Panthers were really concentrating on. You know, point number one was we want freedom, the power to determine the destiny of our community. Uh, number two, if I remember, we want full employment for our people. The other points were decent housing, fit for shelters for human beings, medical care, education. The, the point about police brutality that we were the most famous for was actually point number seven. Wow. We wanted an immediate end to police brutality and the murder of black people. And Huey Newton and, and Bobby Seale got out uh, with shotguns and rifles and law books to, pol to police the police. Mm -hmm. They would stand the legal distance away, the guns were legal. And they would say, look, we have the right to observe. Yeah. They would read the person their rights. They would follow them to the precinct, uh, bail them out if they had the money, if not, call a lawyer, a volunteer young lawyer to help. And no one had seen people stand up 
to the police in such a strong nice. and organized way. Now, to be sure, we weren't polite about this. Mm -hmm. So yes, we were doing the work in the community, but we were revolutionaries because we believe that a people's revolution was the only way that things were gonna truly change. That's right. But in order to have that, it has to be a people's revolution, not the revolution of one organization, not of one dictator. So community organizing was really key. And I learned a valuable lesson from Afeni Shakur, Tupac's mom, um, who, who was, was mentor, right? who was my mentor from the day I walked in the Panther office. At first, she tried to get me to go home because <laughs> she see she saw this crazy kid talking about he wanted a gun, and then she was like, "What are you doing here? You you know you too young to be here," mm -hmm. and I refused to go. She said, "Well, I'm going to keep my eye on you." She became my mentor and my big sister from that moment until she passed away a few years ago, and it's how I happened to be you know, uh, uh, Tupac's goddad. But she taught me so many lessons about um, not only being in, in the Panthers, but about being a man. Uh, but one of the greatest lessons I learned from her about organizing was when she taught me that, look, the goal of the Panther Party is not to have every black man, woman, and child become a Panther. She said, we're here to teach people by example. Yeah. the possibility of struggle, the possibility of fighting for liberation. And if we do our jobs, then you don't need a Black Panther Party because everyone is aware. So a real organizer is there, uh, Maria, to put themselves out of business. If you do your job and the people are organized, then pick a committee and work on that. You've done your job. And so we really need to think of it in that way. You know, when we think about organizations, is it about getting everyone to join or is it about the thing that Fred Hampton understood to let the people do their work where, wherever, because there's work to be done in all areas, right? Housing, health, Im immigration, and to form the coalition so that we work together and support each other. Yeah, it's, uh, it was so forward thinking what you were doing in the 60s. And uh, at the certain point, and, and then the Black Panther Party had the, um, chapters everywhere in the nation. Harlem was one of the strongest. And then tell me what happened, because what happened in the movie with the infiltrator in, in, their, in, in Chicago happened to you too. Because in 69, which is only two years after you joined, and you were only 17 by the time, right? No, actually it happened, it happened, um literally just six months after I joined. Oh. I joined I joined in 68 and in 69, I had just turned 16. Oh my God. And we were arrested in a case that became known as the Panther 21. And it was a conspiracy case. And the idea of that was that anyone that was in a leadership position, uh, again, the local district attorney was a guy named Frank Hogan. And, and he parallels the person that I mentioned in Chicago, Hanrahan, oh. because these men were the second most powerful men in the city, mm -hmm. right? The prosecutors, because they kept law and order and they did it and they probably had secrets on the mayors and all of those things. In the same way that J. Edgar Hoover nationally was the second most powerful person in the country behind the president, some may even say even more powerful because he had secrets on, mm -hmm. on the presidents. Uh, Hogan, who was the district attorney, said, if I arrest all of the leaders, the organization will fall apart. Yeah. And uh, though I was the youngest, uh, I had become leader of the high school cadres. And so I was a young officer. And so that was enough for me to be arrested in this conspiracy case where we were accused of, of, uh, of uh, planning to start guerrilla warfare uh, in New York City. We were going to attack apartment stores and public display things and attack the police. It was fabricated, but the case was made by uh, undercover police officers who had become Panthers. That's now, when I joined the Panthers, my two greatest mentors, I already mentioned Afeni Shakur, I had a mentor named Yewa, who had, was a Vietnam veteran, who was working in housing organization and He's the person who trained me, who taught me hand-to-hand -hand combat. And, you know, when we did get training, how to shoot a gun and 
mm -hmm. uh, how to use a bayonet. And also when I got in trouble with my grandmother because I was, uh, you know, never knew my dad, my grandfather had passed. And so he was this older black woman trying to raise this black boy yeah. um, who was, you know, I was going through what a lot of kids are going through, young men, you know, how do I be a man? Yeah. And I was doing good in school, but I was hanging out in the street corners at night. And to me, the Panthers was like the perfect place. And it was like, I felt like I was with the roughest and toughest and baddest organization, but I had to study and, and do good. And one day grandma found, uh, you know, she kept telling me to straighten up, do my chores, clean up the room. And, you know, after a while, parents get frustrated and they go and they said, like, let me make up his bed. And under my bed was this box full of Panther papers and revolutionary literature, Marx and Castro and Che Guevara. <laughs> and, you know, those Panther papers that had those amazing drawings by Emory Douglas with it with it we call the, the cops pigs and they literally look like pigs and you would have school children <laughs> with school books on one arm and an AK-47 pointing at the pigs oh with God. the other arm my grandmother saw this and hit the roof she went crazy you know, she went crazy and she was like you know first I had to admit that I, yes I was a panther and then she said no way are you going back there because by that time you on the news almost every night you would see a panther being arrested or killed. Wow. Yewa, who was my lieutenant, said, "Let me come talk to your mother." And he came, uh, came to our home uh, in the Bronx, working class section of the Bronx, and he was so charming, and he wore a tie, and he won my grandmother over, and he won her over by saying, "Listen, if you don't want him to be a panther anymore, it's okay." You're his grandmother. We need to listen to you. I need to listen to you. In fact, if you have some chores for me to do, I'll do it. And I'm sitting there going, what is he doing? This is not how it's supposed to go. He said, I'll make, you know, but let me keep an eye on him. I'll make sure that he does his homework. I'll make sure that he uh, does his chores. I'll make sure that he's in the house on time. You know, and my grandmother was, this is, you know, he doesn't have a male Good. figure. Yeah. If you look out for him, he could go back. So I went back. It was less than two months later that they kicked in my grandmother's door, they being the police. Uh, we call them SWAT unit now. Then they were called tactical patrol. Uh, and with full military gear and handcuffed me and drug me out the house at three in the morning. And then I got to police headquarters or really yeah. the district attorney's office. And this is when I saw a Faney and Deruba and all of the other Panthers and we realized we, we thought it was harassment, but then the charges that were read off were things like conspiracy to commit murder and, and weapons possession and bomb possession. We were facing 300 plus years. We still didn't think much of it until they said, here are the witnesses. The, the, here are the people who infiltrated the Panthers and they were in a pretty high position. And they said, and one of them they named was a guy named Gene Roberts who had been Malcolm X's bodyguard, speaking of brother Malcolm. In fact, Maria, there's a photo right after Malcolm was shot of a man, a light-skinned black man with the with giving him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. That's Gene Roberts. He was a cop then, he was part of that unit. But you so come to the Panther office be saying- one behind them? Yeah, going he, but those are the credentials he brought to become a Panther. I was a follower of Malcolm. I was three feet away when he got shot. I tried to save his life. Nice. And the other, this is a unit called the boss unit within the police department. It's called the Bureau of Special Services. The other person was Yewa, my officer. Wow. The person that came to my grandmother's house. He was part of that undercover unit. And that was the case of the Panther 21 in which uh, uh, we were facing 300 years. A couple of things happened in that case. One- You were acquitted though, right? Yeah, yes, we did. We didn't think so. We fought the case on political grounds. Mm -hmm. And again, a Fanny Shakur's name has to really be mentioned in this because they, we were separated to different prisons and they had to get a court order for us to meet in a prison conference room. And a Fanny said, I, and we had a group of really wonderful young progressive lawyers. Yeah. Um, and then and an older black lawyer, amazing 
trial attorney named Charles McKinney, but we had a lawyer, Gerald Lefcourt and Bob Bloom and William Crane, wonderful young lawyers that, that wanted to help us. We said we wanted to put the government on trial instead of vice versa. And Afaini said, I want to defend myself. She had read a book where Fidel Castro had defended himself yeah, when they charged about, him with treason. Yeah. And right. Fidel gave this great closing statement. The name of the book is History Will Absolve Me. And the closing statement that he gave when they were trying him for treason, they wanted to execute him for treason, he said, you call me a criminal, but that's what criminal governments do. Mm -hmm. They make the people fighting for freedom in the criminal so you can continue to commit your crimes. He said, but no matter what you call me, no matter what you do today, you forgive me life if you sentence me to death, history will be the final judge of who I am. Yeah. And history will absolve me. History will find me not guilty. And if Annie wanted to make the case in public as to why she was going to prison for the rest of her life. And um, she made that decision. One other of the uh, the Panthers named uh, Michael Tabor Sechueo said he would defend himself as well. And as much as the lawyers did, it is what they did, what they said to the jury, what they would do when they cross-examined witnesses. You know, when a cop would say, I had the Panthers under surveillance, and then if Fanny would say, well, did you also have Martin Luther King under surveillance? Yes. Did you have Malcolm X under surveillance? Were you one of the police that were there that day that decided to withdraw police protection so that he could be killed? The other thing we had done is we had fought for a really diverse jury. It's one of the points in the 10 point program. We want a jury that reflects that is a, that reflects who we are, a jury of our peer group. So we fought really hard to have a jury and we had a very diverse jury. We had a jury that had more women than usually was in Manhattan at that time, usually was all men. We had black people. And as we were doing this, we think we're just making a case for history the jury was actually listening. <laughs> and when the verdict came back, we were surprised as everyone when they started saying not guilty, not guilty, not guilty. And you were uh, charged with 156 criminal charges. That's right. And you were acquitted for all of them. All right, so we have come to the end of this part of our conversation. But I want to know in one second, what happened? You, you were in prison. You stayed in prison. You remained no, in prison. No, I actually got, I actually, by the time the verdict came for the Panthers that finished the trial, the original number was 21. 13, Afeni and 12 others were actually in the courtroom. I was a fugitive. I had been severed from the case because I was so young. So I was still a member of the Panther 21, but my trial was to come later. So by the time the verdict came, I had been released with the Faney and other Panthers. I had toured the country, giving speeches for the Panthers, raising money, oh helping to I run the Harlem done. and the Bronx chapter and was a fugitive at that time. So I heard about the verdict very joyfully on the news, but I was, I was, uh, I was underground at that time. Wow, I had no idea about this. Another revelation, thank you so much. So after your trial, and after uh, the acquittal, you said that your time spent in the Black Panther Party and in the federal prison was the fire that forged your creative sword. Could you tell us what you mean by that? So I ultimately wound up uh, in federal prison after the Panther 21 uh, trial. Uh, I was active with the Panthers, continued to organize. Um, but after a few years, went back to prison where I was convicted of uh, helping and hiding and helping people, uh, revolutionaries who were on the run for the FBI. Oh, wow. So when you, so, so when that you help someone, terrible. yeah, and when you help someone uh, and you know, you know, that they're on the run, then you could be charged with being an accessory, which I was, and I received 12 years for that. Wow. I sent to uh, Leavenworth Federal Prison, Maximum Security Prison. And I was reminded when I got there 
of uh, two things. Malcolm X had a quote that said, the penitentiary has been the university for many a black man. And Malcolm, who we've been talking about, who was both of our hero, educated himself in prison. Mm -hmm. Literally taught himself to read, to write, and became Malcolm X, El Haj Malik Shabazz, one of the most brilliant thinkers, leaders, and orators of uh, not only of the 20th century, but for the ages. And then uh, there was an older uh, guy in prison, a black prisoner, who said to me when I first got to, to Leavenworth, young blood, you can you could serve this time or you could let time serve you. And that awakened something. Wow. Yeah. And uh, I began to write. I'd met uh, during the during just before I went to prison, I met Joyce, uh, my wife, mm -hmm. who was a who's a, an actress and a writer. And she was pregnant with our son Jamal. Wow. So I started thinking about what I could do inside, but what life would be like on the outside. Yeah. KU University of Kansas had a college program. They were one of the pioneers in doing this. So four nights a week, you could go to college. Oh, wow. That's good. So I was able to earn degrees in psychology and sociology from KU, from the University of Kansas. Degrees. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's nothing, you know, uh, that distinguishes me from someone who went to the main campus, you know, KU's uh, symbol is the, the Jayhawks. It's not like on my diploma, my Jayhawk is behind bars going like, what's up, peace. <laughs> uh, and then I started writing uh, uh, poetry and plays. And so- Five what, plays and two volumes of poetry. Two volumes of poetry. <laughs> the interesting thing about playwriting, a friend who was in prison, a former Panther, uh, named Jihad uh, Abdul Mumit had been doing some playwriting. And he and a couple of other guys knew that uh, I had been done some theater. And they kind of just came to me saying, hey man, you know, I'm I'm leaving, but you know, Black History Month is coming up. You should do something. So I said, okay. So I uh, got a friend who was a playwright, a childhood friend and sent me a couple of plays to see the format. And I wrote this piece that was for Black History Month. Mm -hmm. We were rehearsing. We got uh, the administration to give us a little area where we could rehearse. Leavenworth, like many prisons, is very segregated. Because the men's white but, and black in different spaces. There's different sections of the yard, and that they're called courts or courtyards, and you don't go into somebody else's section. So the black prisoners, the Latino prisoners, everybody has their own section. And these guys are all serious guys doing serious time, you know, uh, 50 years, wow. 75 years, double life. And they bring that same crew mentality, gang mentality. In the prison. In the prison. Mm -hmm. Those are the same kind of beefs. And so the Latino brothers, who were different gangs, but many La Eme, the Mexican mafia, they're like a really, really serious crew. People know that they don't play. And when somebody's doing life, if they get into a fight, their attitude is like, I'm just gonna take this guy out so he doesn't bother me anymore. What's another murder charge? I'm already doing a life sentence. What are you gonna do? Take away my driver's license? <laughs> so we're rehearsing and I'm with a couple of black guys trying to you know, get them into the piece, you know, teaching them through improv. And two of the leaders of the Mexican mafia come in, serious brothers, they're doing life. And they had about three or four murder charges since they were in prison. Forget about what brought them there. So we knew they were heavy hitters. And we knew typically when they left their section, they had a beat, they came to kill somebody. They come into the rehearsal, and they sit down and they're dead faced, like they're mad about something. And they're beefed up from the way pile, tats all over the body, and they're just watching. And we're watching out the corner of our eye. So nobody's right rehearsing. Yeah, right rehearsing. Right. And I'm looking at one guy in particular, Tito, who's one of the leaders, 
And every time I glance at him, Tito's getting madder and madder. And then after about 15 minutes, he stands up and he points right at me. And he was like, yo, Essay, let me talk to you a minute. And I was like, it's me. I just got here. What's my beef with this guy? <laughs> I said, OK, well, just, you know, see what he's talking about. If You, you know, if you got to get into it, you got to get into it. But, you know, I know this is a dangerous guy. And he pulls me to the side, Maria, and he says, Yo, Holmes, Essay, I heard what you've been doing here, man. And I had to come check it out for myself. Wow. I've been sitting here for about 20 minutes. And I'm going to tell you something. And I want you to listen to me good, Essay. That guy you're working with, that effing guy, Essay, he's not feeling his character. <laughs> oh, my God. So, I was like, well, why don't you get in? And he got in and he was good and he made his friend get in. So I rewrote the play so that there was some Latino brothers. Before you know it, a couple of the white brothers were showing up and these were serious guys who were like, you know, from motorcycle gangs. And this play became <clears throat> this multicultural thing. Oh my God, wonderful. <clears throat> and we started having, so we did this play. Then they said, when is the next one? And we started having our own section of the yard and guys started communicating about their past, how they got to be who they were, how they started hating each other. And we were able to reduce the level of gang violence. My God, wonderful. In it. And I started to realize that there still could be social justice and change and revolution, but that I would use some different weapons going forward. Mm -hmm. And that's why I write about forging my creative sword that there were still things to do, but I would, I would, you know, It'd be able to well, use well. the two things that I had picked up while I was there, which was arts and education to, to fight the battle on those fronts. Yeah. Fantastic. This is an amazing, amazing story that I had no idea about. And you should write the book just about this because this is incredible. This shows that everything that is happening today is happening only because for four years we had the madman in the White House who brought up all the hate that has always been there, but that was not clear. He has brought it to the surface and made it okay. And I am scared of what's going on in this country because the the level of of unsafety and hate that i feel that i never felt before it's it i know where it comes from it comes from that and it's terrible that it should come from the person who should have given the best example of unity but has used the the tool that the romans used in their empire divide et impera divide and conquer and you showed that unity is the solution for that. So thank you. And we can and, and in mentioning that, I mean, listen, we we are in a time of fascism. And when you look at the history of fascism, what yeah. happens in what happens in a fascist state? What happened with Hitler? What happened with Mussolini? Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, education is attacked, the arts are attacked. Um, the, the, the white men are made to feel that they are victims and oppressed in their own country. Yeah. And what you have to do is then you have to create a national enemy, right? So in Italy, it was the communist party mm -hmm. in, uh, in Germany, it was the Jews and the Christians in both places. It was the intellectual class and Trump worked from that playbook cutting anything that seemed like progressive thought for change, creating all of these enemies. First, it was the Muslims. Then it became Latino people. Uh, then it became the Chinese people when mm -hmm. COVID came. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, and then, and then giving, uh, empowering the white races to say, you can come after everybody. You can come after black people. You can come after uh, come after LGBTQ people, so that's what we live in, and so we we've got to call it as such. We have to understand that 
uh, uh, we can't relax the way we did under the Obama administration, thinking everything is going to be all right because we, we, we in the White House we have someone who, uh, you know, who seems to be you know more compassionate and wants to aid. The seeds of racism and fascism are deep in the soul of this country, and it doesn't change because of who's in the White House. It's systemic. That means we have to fight systemically and organize around that way. But it also means we have to have our communities organized day to day. Protests are great. Standing up is great. It made a big difference what happened with all of the support and solidarity around Black Lives Matter after the murders of uh, Breonna Taylor uh, and uh, George Floyd. But the Panthers understood, but by that, but so did the civil rights movement, is that people have to see you every day. Yeah. Because freedom to people that are not on social media or that are struggling to survive means different things, right? Freedom to someone that is starving is a meal if you're hungry. Liberation to someone who uh, doesn't have a place to stay is a dry, warm place for them and their children to sleep. Yes. Justice to someone that can't get medical care is compassionate care and free care. So what the Panthers understood and other, other grassroots organizations that have been inspired by the Panthers is that you use these programs and you use your presence in the community to make the connection for people with their personal needs to the greater struggle and let them participate at the level. Everyone couldn't join the Black Panther Party but they weren't meant to be Panthers. Everybody may not be able to join Black Lives Matter or other progressive organizations, we always said, if you have a progressive consciousness, a revolutionary consciousness, then you're part of the struggle. Yeah. So to you that end- Whatever tool you have. Yes, let the bakers bake, let the teachers teach, let the healers heal, let the artists make art, but to do so in the spirit of the people, in the spirit of people's revolution. Yes, and that's what you're doing today a filmmaker and Columbia University professor. And your struggle for liberation continues because you are a member of a Black Panther Party Alumni Association, and you fight with other Panther veterans for the release of political prisoners and against racism and fascism is in all four. Uh, I have to mention but, two people in specific, and, and there are many political prisoners we're fighting for, but Sundiata Okoli, um, who was one of the Panther 21 mm -hmm. and acquitted, but was uh, uh, was arrested and framed around the uh, uh, Sada Shakur's case and a shootout that happened on the New Jersey Turnpike, has been in prison. He is 80 years old now. Oh, and Sundiata Akoli has been in prison since 1978. So people are fighting for his release um, he has been a model prisoner. He is a, of harm to anyone. And he is more, even if you believe the charges, which we dispute, we say he was a passenger in a car. He has done the equivalent of three life sentences. Usually a life sentence is 20 years, 25 years, they let you go. And the other person that we want to talk about is Mumia Abu-Jamal, yes. who was a young Panther. He also joined the Panthers very young. I think he beat me by a year. I think he joined when he was 14 years old in Philadelphia. He became an award-winning journalist. Mm -hmm. And he has been in prison uh, since the 1980s, uh, framed up over uh, the death of a police, o police officer. Uh, Amnesty International has declared him a political yeah. prisoner. The European Parliament about him. He's now literally fighting for his life. He has diabetes, mm -hmm. he has COVID, he is not getting compassionate care. They, they're keeping him shackled even while in the hospital. So we are calling and asking people to call the uh, district attorney's office uh, in Philadelphia. And I'll communicate some information, maybe that can be put up a flyer of where to call in those numbers to demand for his immediate release. Please. And again, it's compassionate release because of his health care, but it, from death row to that sentence being moved to a life sentence, he's already served the equivalent of three life sentences and they want him to die in prison. Yeah. What's the fear from this man who is now in his late sixties, who is frail because of all of the stuff that he's gone through 
uh, in his health, except his mind and his experience that has always been about awareness and the uplift and the love of the people. Well, this is this is really terrible, but thank you for this. So we have we, we can launch and let our our viewers know that and share this information. It's very important. So you are also talking about what you are doing, and that's how I met you, the artistic executive artistic director of New Heritage Theater and Films, together with Boza River. And you are the founder of Impact Repertory Youth Theater of Harlem. I've seen a few of your pieces and dances, and they are amazing. And this is how I first got in touch with you. And uh, you also co -wrote, you wrote the book behind you, Topak Shakur, about his life and about what happened. And you are now. Um, uh, currently adopt, adapting it into a television series for stars. Is that what you're doing right now? So I'm working on the Tupac project, which is uh, uh, which is being produced by FX. It's going to be a four hour documentary. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm a co-producer of this film. That's a four hour documentary on Tupac's life that really looks at his mom, Afeni Shakur, mm -hmm. her background, and their relationship and the influence of Afeni on her son's life. Other documentaries kind of dive straight into Tupac, yeah. but it really sets uh, the stage of, well, the kind of right. When, when Afeni was giving her closing argument to the jury in the Panther 21 case, Afeni was eight months pregnant. Wow. Tupac, uh, the opening line of this book says, Tupac was in prison before he was even born. My God. And if any believed she would have the baby, be able to keep the baby for two or three months, and that he would be raised by uh, by her sister, by by uh, by Gloria. Uh, the other project I'm working on is uh, for stars. I'm adapting my book, Panther Baby, which is a memoir into uh, what we hope is going to be a television series that looks at the 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 uh, the Black Panther Party through the eyes of a 15, 16, 17 year old Jamal Joseph. Wow, fantastic. So you have a lot of projects in the making right now. And um, you, another time we got in touch with each other and we collaborated with each other was when you co-wrote with Daniel Beatty and directed the feature film Chapter and Verse. This was in 2015. And it was shown at Mist first, and then it went all over in every in many theater, and also on BET. Uh, tell me a little bit about that because he had incredible names like Omari Hardwick, Loretta Divine, Kadim Diop, Mark Jefferies, and so on. Uh, tell a little bit the story. We only have two minutes left. So Chapter and Verse is a film that looks at a man coming home from prison, returning to Harlem, fighting to change his life. And this man uh, uh, becomes friends with a grandmother, uh, Loretta Devine, because he gets, even though he's trained in prison to fix computers, he can only get a job delivering food. And he makes a choice. Her son is at the crossroads, her grandson, between getting a scholarship to college to be an artist and hanging on the corner Again, that same dilemma, what is real manhood? Because she's raising him by himself. And uh, the lead character played by Daniel, um, L is his name in the film, makes a decision to give up his second chance so this young man can have a first chance. So we're real proud of that message. The film, without saying the words, talks about mass incarceration, talks about police brutality, talks about gentrification in Harlem. And we think it's a love letter to the community. Harlem and its people are very much a character in the film. And yes, you're right, it ran on BET. You, it's now available on uh, Amazon and those other outlets. So Chapter and Verse, uh, directed by Jamal Joseph, you can see it. And Impact Repertory Theater is a uh, is an arts and activist program for young people uh, between the ages of 12 and 19. 
Also, we'll send the information where young people can call for an interview and for auditions. We take young people who have the desire to perform and also want to make a difference uh, in, in the community. And this is your other weapon, not the Black Panther now, but the theater. Young people don't hang on the corner, come and do something creative. Come and be a dancer, come and be a creator, come and be a, a, a writer, uh, come and be an actor. You are giving them all these choices. And this is fantastic. Yes, and choose about organizing. So activism and art, we say at Impact, when you combine an, an artist and an activist, you have an artivist. So we're building an army of young artivists. Fantastic. On this note, we close our conversation on the activists that you are uh, helping to create their own life and, 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 and become men and women in a positive way. Thank you so much, Jamal Joseph, for having spent this time with us. Thank you for everything you've done in your life and what you're still doing and all the things that you're gonna do because I know you're doing a lot and your son is doing a lot too. So we have to interview him next time. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Thank Positive you. thoughts as we say at Impact and all power to the people. That's right. And thank you to my Harlem Portraits viewer. See you next Saturday. Bye-bye. <laughs>